Hello, everyone, and welcome to class number 18 of the Crypto Oracle AI Web3 Accelerator. Today's class is on product strategy, and uh, we have two lecturers, uh, two of our own uh, mentors and uh, collective members, uh, Charles Knobel and Andy Singleton. Uh, so we still have people coming. And so first, uh, happy Crypto Mondays to everyone. We're going to have a good event in uh, New York today featuring um, a senior person from the Solana Foundation. So it should be a fun evening. We should have a good crowd in New York. Anybody going to Crypto Monday elsewhere? Andy, did somebody reach out to you about getting uh, Boston going? Yes, they did. And we have a, we have a venue, so... No right. excuses. Next week. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, give, spend five minutes on administrative tasks, uh, five minutes on uh, anybody who has thoughts that they want to share on the last uh, week's uh, pitch practice number two. Uh, and then uh, Charles and Andy are going to talk and, and Eric is going to put a bow around it. Uh, and we still should have you know, at least 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, afterwards, sent out in today's email a, a link to CB Insights did a, a state of AI uh, that I think has you know, got a lot of good data in it. Um, uh, in particular, uh, I thought they had this interesting list of 10, um, uh, 10 of the largest, uh, the 10 largest seed slash angel deals. So, you know, 70 million seed is pretty, pretty awesome, but was also interesting as part of this, there was a whole list of VCs. So actually, you know, as I think everybody should have been shared, the VC, the, the Crypto Oracle VC list, which is kind of an open source for, you know, all of our members. And um, so we, I just started a new tab for AI VCs. And, you know, uh, you know, everybody here should really start familiarizing yourselves with the, you know, both the you know, Web3 and, and AI VCs, you know, the, the fundraising, few thoughts, fundraising is a process, demo day is, is one step in the process, and you all need to make sure that you all own this process and, and understand the process and how to optimize the likelihood of you being successful in that process. And we're here as a resource for you, um, you know, to help you as much as we can, you know, but ultimately, you know, obviously, you know, the, the responsibility lies with you guys. Um, uh, I don't know if there's uh, anything to update uh, on the impact room side. Uh, no, I'm just waiting on a couple more customizations that should be implemented uh, tomorrow, I think, and then we'll we'll move forward on that some more. We'll have more news on Wednesday, hopefully. Okay, cool. More news on Wednesday. Um, we also have the results of the second cohort questionnaire. Eight of the ten uh, of you responded, so thanks for that. And Let's get to 10 out of 10 on, on the next one. Um, you know, and there were kind of six major questions. So go through, I sent the link to it, but you know, at the highest level, you know, uh, 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 six of the eight, you know, get give higher or very high. And there was some feedback on what we can do to, to get better that, um, you know, we're obviously taking that in. Um, uh, and then, you know, in terms of last, uh, last week's, Pitch practice number two. I don't know if anybody, uh, any of the cohort members had anything that they wanted to share, you know, either or both in terms of, you know, lesson, lessons learned and and anything that we can do to improve before uh, the next one. We've got two more VCs lined up on uh, two more uh, on Friday. Yeah. I'm happy to jump in. It's Piotr, Piotr from Paypangia, the, the bold one. Um, <laughs> we, we found it... Uh, much cleaner in regards to the speed dating process we had before. So I think it was really well uh, allocated, five minutes and five minutes for feedback, which was very good. Uh, I think it was uh, less hectic jumping between between the rooms, uh, which was really good. And from the uh, presentations we did, uh, you know, there were some, we're getting much cleaner in terms of, uh, and more memorable in regards to presentation. Uh, fairly smooth description, fitting within the four to five minutes, and then buying the next five to 10 minutes of feedback and questions. Uh, we came across some uh, challenges as well, which was actually very good, good uh, you know, description and clarification of the product. So thank you, Eric. 
uh, that was uh, that was very good. We're going to address that by Friday, uh, and we feel that the practices we are doing actually are helping us out in terms of the partner presentations. That is obviously key aspect of uh, our acquisition strategy in terms of using PayPanGia and PayPanGia Open API. So we're we're heading in a good direction. So yeah, I feel uh, I feel it more we do that uh, with the, with the people you're bringing in Lou are you know better for us and thank you appreciate that okay good thanks thanks for the feedback yeah i mean we've got two more lined up this week and we'll get two more the the following week as as well so that's the plan anybody else have anything they want to add once twice i think um one thing Lou, that you mentioned earlier and owning the process you know to to everyone as the VCs come on, you know, I think it's really important to understand that I think everyone does know this, but there's not, there's nobody's getting like an automatic check because they knew Lou, right? That's not going to happen. But certainly, I think you will get a conversation. And the goal of the incubator is really to say when you get that conversation, you have all of the collective knowledge of all the instructors, everyone else, the speakers, so that the questions you're going to get, you're not going to fumble. When you get in front of that VC, um, if you look at it that way and say, "Hey, everything I'm learning is is probably going to be a question at some point," and so having some answers better than none, um, that's going to get you really far when you do get in those meetings. So if we do have seven, eight, nine, ten VCs who come through as well, it's a miss to not ask for a pitch for any of them, right? If that VC comes on and leaves and you didn't ask for the pitch, you didn't ask for a coffee meeting or something. Right, you, you gotta you gotta make that ask, and then again use everything we're we're showing you. But just want to put that out for everyone that that there is great opportunity here, and that's just it's just how it's framed. Because I know for everyone, fundraising is top of mind. Okay, cool. Okay, thanks, Charles. Um, so that is uh, that's what I've got, and then uh, so Charles, you want to? Yeah, All share right. some thoughts on product strategy. Sure, absolutely. Um, all right, let me share and let me put it in slideshow mode. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Fantastic. So uh, as we, a little bit of background, one of the things we talked about, we the, the, the team talked about last week was there seemed to be sort of this idea or, or a lack thereof in some ways in some of the presentations, I think a, a lack of cohesiveness about the product narrative and product strategy among a lot of the, the the companies pitching, right? And not to say you don't have one, but we thought it might be good to use this session to sort of go back over, you know, what is a product narrative? How are you telling the story of your product? And and how do you make a strategy if you don't have one? So I'm going to go pretty fast, take about 10 minutes, uh, and then this will be emailed to everyone as well. So you can always follow me, ask questions like you ask anybody. Um, but that's the goal of today is saying, you know, what is product strategy? Like, what does that actually mean, Right. And I think for, for a lot of people, right, it's sort of aligning your business goals, you know, and ensuring you're using your resources so that in your pitch, you know, what should happen is somebody walks away with understanding what your product strategy really is, right? Um, even if they're not going to invest or even if they're not going to, you know, do something that they, they should be very clear about what you're trying to do with your product. And so typically in a pitch deck, you see something that looks like this, like we're going to get to 100,000 visitors a day. We're going to have 4 million bucks by the end of the year. Our customer is this. And this is like a good one, right? A lot of people will kind of go through and miss this even, but say this is a typical pitch deck slide that talks about the product strategy, but it's not actually a product strategy if you look at it, right? You know, what product strategy should be is telling the tale of your product. You know, what is the customer problem you're solving? What is the business problem you're solving? What are the market opportunities in the future, right? So we're building this because in the future, we want to get to these opportunities. And then these are the steps needed to get there. The reason I think this is really critical for everyone to sort of convey is when you give a pitch, you're really asking for two things, right? To a VC, let's say. <clears throat> One, you're asking for money, obviously, but two, you're asking for help. And so outside of write me a check, which is the help I need, if somebody understands your product strategy, they can also, you know, how do I refer you to somebody? How do I connect you with somebody? Is this something I can help you with? The clearer your strategy is and clearer your objectives are, the more help you're going to get, right? Because people know how to help you. You know, uh, a big one that we see missing in a lot of meetings and a lot of these presentations is, you know, market size, right? Everyone talks about total addressable market, right? If I'm building a platform that's targeting advertising, it's a $10 billion trillion dollar industry or something, right? 
that's fine. But then as we get down to what's the service addressable market, right? Like what can you actually serve? So if you're saying, look, we're launching in North America, your service addressable market for your product might just be North America. Your target market though, is really who are you aiming at within that sphere, within that universe, right? And this is where a lot of people, the two, the three and four, which I'll get to, a lot of people mess this up in terms of your strategy. Say, well, what's my target market? So be specific, right? It's You're better to be specific than vague. So I'm joking here, but kind of not, right? All the adult male left-handed Greeks in Rome need our product. Okay, well, that gives somebody you're pitching to like a, a sense of who are you trying to get to, right? Uh, and then do I know anybody? Do I know, do I know left-handed Greeks in Rome I can refer this product to, right? By, by, by clearly identifying that target market, right? Then the market share becomes part of it. Like one of the things that I've mentioned before, and I'll say it again here, a lot of times people will say, oh, we're going to get 5% of the market because it equals a big number, right? Like the market is $2 trillion and the service address markets, you know, $500 billion and we're going to have 5% market share of that. And when you look in the space of those things like advertising, you're competing with Google, right? And, you know, if you say we're going to get this or we're going to disrupt Google, I'm going to tell you like, no, you're not like you're, you're not. <laughs> you, I mean, you might, but probably not, not, not right away. So in case in point, you know, uh, I had this call conversation once with the founder of Sam Adams and Sam Adams, massive beer manufacturer. I'm sure everyone on the call knows who Sam Adams is. And as I was talking to him at the end, it was really interesting. He said, you know, we're less than 1% of beer consumption in America, right? And I'm like, Sam Adams is a massive company. They're in every supermarket everywhere. They're all, he's like, yeah, we're we're still less than 1%, right? And it gave me a sense of like, okay, right? So when we see these numbers, when he sees we're going to get 10% of a market or we're going to get, I mean, if, you're, if your target market's super small and super niche, maybe. But if you're talking, you know, on a lot of our decks that I've been watching, the numbers of these really big numbers, and the percentages are this hockey stick sort of thing that it doesn't really, it's not really realistic, right? So be specific about who you want and be specific about your market share and define your market. You know, this is dense. This deck is dense and we're going fast, but you know, who are your customers? What do they need? What do they want? What issues do they have? Are they willing to pay for this fix? Right. Do you, do you have any experience in this market? Do you have a champion? Like, yes, I have experience and I've got my first POC customer and they're saying it's awesome too. Right. Each one of your customers is actually a validator proving your market strategy. Right. So, you know, this this market definition canvas, again, this will be emailed out. It's just a tool, um, you know, that I've seen that I've seen floated around a lot talking about, like, what is a market and then how do you sort of fit your product around the market? So please use this when you get a chance to, to go through the exercise and try and see if you can fill this in for yourself. But, but again, who are our customers, right? So we've identified market strategy. We have identified service versus market. Who is your customer, right? When you're building that product out, because that's where it starts, right? Who is our customer? So describing describing it. Again, slides like this I see all the time. You know, our customers work in leadership management roles in the tech industry. Okay. We're primarily targeting SMBs with a company size of 200 people or less who operate Web3. Better, Right. Fun fact, 73% say hummus is their favorite snack. Now, the reason people like the fun fact is it proves mastery, right? It, it, the assumption there is that you know your market so well that you know that about them too. And you should, right? You should be able to say, who, who is my customer and who are these people I'm trying to target, right? Case in point, a lot of really good startups who build stuff build this thing called a customer persona, where they're looking at, you know, we're looking for CTOs in this company size with this industry, we're going to use social media to, like this slide right here. You'll see behind some of the best the best companies that launch because they're looking for what's the goal, what's the frustration, who is this person, right? And they use this sort of as a, a barometer of how do I get to them? Because you plug all this information into like LinkedIn and you're going to get, you know, a, a series of users. You can keep refining that idea. But if you have this idea that you're just going to put the product out in the universe and the universe is going to respond, I mean, it, it might, but it helps to have a direction. Right. And, and it really helps to say, you know, who am I really talking to? Pitching to VCs is one thing, pitching to customers is another. Who are the customers? Where are they? And then does anybody know these people? That helps a lot as well. You know, again, building on the product strategy, outlining the problem, right? Um, Albert Einstein, I think, said it best, right? If I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes about solutions. But how often do we sort of do the reverse where we spend 55 minutes about solution and not enough time really thinking about the problem? You know, 
who's your target customer, right? What's their pain point? What, you know, most of the products you see, anything we're building really should solve a pain point. And, you know, a great example here, what's the cost, current cost of pain? So this slide was from 2012, but, you know, it summarized it really well, right? Patients in moderate pain pay $4,516 more than annual healthcare costs with no pain. So that, that sort of really clarifies, okay, the market opportunity we're chasing is $4,000 a customer, right? But your product should, if, if, you know, it remove the pain or improve the pain that the customer is experiencing. And if you can't explain that well in terms of codifying your product, you're going to have a really hard time then selling that later. And even a harder time saying, well, once the initial pain is solved, what's the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, right? When we talk about goals, right, here's the problem. Here, so again, target customer pain point, current cost of pain. We talk about goals, you know, I again see this in, in slides a lot. These are not actually problem goals. So our goal is getting 10,000 people into the website, 85% activation rate in our product, reaching 1 million AR. These are not actually problem goals. These are these are company goals. These are things you'd like to see happen. But it doesn't tell, you know, the person you're pitching or your customer anything about the product itself, the strategy. Where are you going with this? If I if I buy this thing, what happens next? So in defining those product goals, there's another acronym that I'm pulling here for you that I liked um, that talks about it. You know, what is the specific goal? What is the measurable thing you're doing? What how is this attainable? How is this relevant? How is this time-based, right? So, you know, if you say, if you say to us something like, I'm going to get 100,000 paying customers in six months after launch, like how, right? That's not a product goal. That's a, that's, that's a hope. And hope's not a strategy, right? As, as people say. So using this, if you, if you really take your product and you work the, work the idea backwards, you know, are you being specific and are you measuring, like, how am I going to get there? You know, also product differentiators. If you're comparing yourself in your strategy to some other product, right? And we encourage you to do that all the time. We're saying, oh, say, you know, come in the tagline in your one minute elevator pitch. I am the this of this, right? Like one of the platforms I'm building, you know, we are creating essentially the Carfax of real estate, right? By aggregating all real estate information all into one platform. You know, you buy a car, you see everything about it from Carfax report, but you buy a house, you see nothing. That's my company, NFCO, right? But in the differentiation, if I had to talk about who's my competitor, you know, why is my product, what the quality of it better? Is my pricing better? Is my design better? Is my service better? Are my features better? Is my customization ability for each, you know, customer coming in better, right? What makes my product better than my comp competition? And the best example I can think of of product differentiators that do the same thing is like Coke and Pepsi. You know, it's really polarizing, right? I don't know very many people who say they like both. But that's because they've done a really good job differentiating from each other. And your and so should your product as well. You know, success metrics. This was a slide I was going to talk through, but being the way we're limited time, we'll talk about it later. But, you know, again, for yourself internally, for your stakeholders, for your investors, you know, how do you know you're going in the right direction? How do you know you're successful? You know, I see slides like this all the time in pitches where they talk about, you know, success in terms of money. And that's true. Yeah. If, if Maybe if your product is doing really well, you'll have signups, but it's, it, that's not really, that's the byproduct of the success. That's not the success itself. The success is all the things that are happening in the product that drive forward to that, right? The, you know, the fact that your workflows work well, the fact that the product's sticky, that it's differentiated all, you know, as you're building this out, you got to have those success metrics defined. And last two slides, you know, product vision, right? So product vision, you'll hear this a lot. If you go and you Google things like how to build a product strategy, you'll hear about product vision. But the product vision is really the why. Like, why are we doing this? So I've got some examples here you can read. But, you know, the product strategy is the how and the roadmap is the what, right, as you work through that. So, again, get a chance, read through this and think about this. Like at Ikea, you know, the vision is to create an, a better everyday life for many people. In that vision statement, they don't talk about furniture at all, Right. Um, Amazon to be your most customer centric company. They don't talk about books or products at all there, right? It's just that everyone should have that vision in your company and your stakeholders should as well. And lastly, product idea, right? So if you give a pitch and if you talk about your product and if you have the strategy, you know, the user, the person hearing this should walk away with what's the idea of this product, right? What, you know, I, I may not agree with you. I may not write you a check. But I should have no confusion about what the idea of your product is after sitting through a 10-minute pitch, right? 
you can pull out things if I'm interested. Yeah, you should have a product roadmap, which talks about all the features you're going to build out, right? All the different things. You should have a feature breakdown list. You know, how do you move from the scope from what you're talking about to individual features that line down under your product, right? And of course, you should have a product strategy document. But all of those things exist to inform your product idea, right? What are we building and what is the concept that's going to go out in the market and continue delivering as you go forward? So with that, I think I'm, I think I hit 10 minutes, Lou. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Andy and then we can visit some of this again in the Q&A. Yeah. And there's, yeah. Uh, thanks, Charles. Um, so uh, there is, uh, you know, there was that, that was very dense, a, a lot of information there, but the nice thing is it's recorded uh, and you'll be able to review it again and you'll get a copy of the deck. Um, and uh, next, you know, we'll turn it over to Andy. He's going to kind of talk about the product strategy from, from a different viewpoint. Andy, you're mute. All right. In theory, this should fit really well with what uh, what we just heard. Um, continuing on the idea of targeting. Can you guys see the screen there? Yes. All right. So I just want to make one point because I think it's important for at least some of the people in the cohort. If you have product management experience, you probably don't have the problem that I'm describing here. But if you're a salesperson or a fundraiser or a technological builder, there's a good probability that, that you're going to create this problem for yourself, which is it takes you a long time to release a product because your product is a little bit over ambitious. And Lou, you recall how frustrated I got with the people at Chromia. Yeah. So we, <laughs> we recently did a consulting job with a, a a blockchain called Chromia, they have been building this blockchain for five years and it's still not in full release. And it's really, really obvious why they have this problem. They set out to build a blockchain that was based on a relational database. That was the idea. But then their sort of their follow on idea, when you ask them, how should it be used? They would say, well, it should do all the things that Ethereum and other general purpose blockchains do. That was their design goal for their first release. And if you set something like that as your design goal, you're just never going to get to a release. There's too many things that it has to do. And what you really want to do if you're a startup is build for one actual real customer that has a smaller set of requirements. And what you're actually looking for in your customer base is people who will tell you what they don't want. So like I said, if you have a product management background, you, you already know this, but Otherwise, this might be news to you. So for instance, it was news to the people at Microsoft. Have you ever used Microsoft Office? It has a gajillion features. So they did an interesting thing, which is they released Microsoft Office as Microsoft 365, which was an online SaaS version where they could measure every user action. And one of the first things that the product managers reported back, they literally said this. They said, we found out that 80% of our ideas were bad. Now, it doesn't mean the ideas were bad. It just means that users only used 20% of the product. And the thing that I've noticed is it doesn't matter how good your product management is, it's still going to be 20%, right? Users are still going to use 20% of your product. So in theory, you can get a 500% or 400% increase in productivity, development productivity, if you knew what that 20% was. Um, and... I'm going to go back to the persona. This is the danger of using personas. Because if you use a persona, that will tell you the 100% that they want. It's not going to tell you the 80% they're not going to use. For that, you need a real person. So just that might, might save you the price of admission. Um, Paul Graham says this weird thing, do things that don't scale. And the reason that that's so weird is because 100% of his vast fortune is due to huge successes that scaled hugely, right? So why does he say do things that don't scale? Because he's looking, first of all, he's usually right because he's an obsessive guy. I know the guy pretty well. And and he's gone through all the evidence from hundreds and hundreds of, of Y Combinator startups. And it's it sort of became obvious to him that if you're a founder and you're forced to manually do stuff for a customer, you get 
a lot more focus than than if you're not doing that manual labor. It's sort of the pain of it is the point. And um, sort of an anecdote about that is I was the first person to turn down a Y Combinator deal. So I was starting Assembla and I called Paul and I said, do you want to do an angel investment? And he said, well, I'll give you $10,000. And I said, why would I want $10,000? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I literally said that. And that shows you, it goes, yeah, I'm giving hackers $10,000 and then I'm inviting to my house on Thursdays for dinner. And it sort of shows you that you kind of need uh, targeting that makes a lot of smart people say, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And I'm especially <laughs> bad at that, but it makes sense, right? Um, then there's this apocryphal statement from Henry Ford, which I'm sure you've heard. If I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse. And I'm sh most people are sure that it wasn't Henry Ford because it fits so perfectly with what product managers actually try to explain. But you're, the, the problem with targeting that large addressable market that Charles was talking about, right? They're not left-handed Greeks. The problem is that large addressable market is already buying a product they're happy with, and they're very conservative about that. And you're not going to get them to admit that they're going to switch from horses to cars. And kind of in the worst case, this is sort of one of those weird things. This is where having a founder who's just an arrogant jerk kind of helps you, right? You have like Henry Ford and Elon Musk and Steve Jobs. They, you know, most of the time, probably that kind of founder doesn't get anywhere. They just piss a lot of people off. But when they're right, they're really right. You know, they they have expertise that normal people don't have. Um, and then there's Amazon. And Amazon to me is, they're the gold standard statistically of product management, because unlike Apple, which has like four products and they struggle to do, you know, one update a year, Amazon has hundreds and hundreds of products. They have, you know, Amazon web services and logistics and they productize everything. And, um, They've turned into a machine. One part of the machine is a press release where they imagine before they even start building the product that there's a detailed quote from an actual person, the testimonial that they're going to say about this pro that product. So even before they have a customer, they have putting words into a real customer's mouth. Um, now you can make it easier to do targeting by taking this approach to the addressable market. So Charles showed you like the whole top-down approach. But actually, I'm not a big advocate for that. Um, I feel like people are pretty happy with just two points. One is that's kind of take the pressure off, right? One is this is a big addressable market. And I actually don't think that there's a lot of pressure for that, especially in the blockchain world, right? Because nobody's going to see your pitch unless they already believe that this is a big addressable market and that it's an expensive problem and that people are going to eventually pay up for it. So, but you do have to indicate yeah, this is a big expensive problem. They also, as Charles noted, they're not going to believe that you're going to make a statistically significant dent in that market. doesn't matter what percent you put of like, I'm going to get that market. It's not likely as a small startup that you're going to make a dent in it, which is great, right? It, it takes the pressure off. And then you can start with the user base that's small and reachable. So that was the point that Charles made. And you know, maybe smaller than you think is adequate for this positioning purpose. Um, and you're gonna run into a lot of people that are wrong <laughs> about this. Enterprise buyers, they always last from, ask for a much longer list than, than is helpful. Salespeople, so if you're a salesperson on this call, now you know how everybody else views your claims that, hey, we're gonna get these huge deals and we need all these features. And in fact, you probably, been, this is a, something you're really gonna have to keep in mind more than maybe people in other roles, um, legacy product customers, investors. So you want a different positioning for investors around this high level opportunity than you do from, for customers. Um, and then finally, this is the one that I'm most likely to violate. People who want high quality, either as buyers or developers. Um, quality doesn't help you, only demand helps you. Like we have a lot of statistics that show this. The startups that win, win because they get a crappy product into a market with huge demand. So, um, you know, don't get, it's almost never true that if somebody comes to you and says, it just needs to be higher quality, more reliable, better UI. If they say that that's all it needs, they're just wrong. 
um, you know, you can make a great product that way with lackluster demand. And um, there's three major forcing functions that people use. One is positioning, this idea of starting with a real customer and putting a, putting a testimonial in their mouth. Um, one is just the normal way of working up from one customer to say the first 10 with sales and marketing. And then the one that accelerators all use, which is time boxing. So the idea of time boxing is that you set a date to release your product and then you release your product on that date and you just ruthlessly cut the feature set until you can hit the, hit the date. And I actually, this was not a common approach back in the day. I made a living going around to VC back companies that had never released a product and just dropping it as a temporary CTO and saying, no, you're gonna release a product. What are we cutting? Um, you, what you get to pick is not the feature set, but who is going to use it. So you get to pitch the targeting and not the release date. Well, let's just cut down the who is going to use it until it fits the release date. Um, accelerators now maybe overuse this tactic, but um, that's my idea. Anyway, hopefully that will save you guys, so some of you guys, a crap load of time. So thanks, Andy. Um, two great talks. Uh, thanks again, Charles. Um, you know, there was a lot out there for for folks to digest, uh, and now you know we left a, a good chunk of time at the end uh, for Q and A. But before that, uh, we're going to have uh, Eric. You want to you want to finish things off? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to just uh, sum it sum this up um, specifically for the. Um, for our group here. Uh, so all of us have spent enough time together now that, that we've heard all of your pitches multiple times and, and watched you evolve a little bit. We're about halfway through, so it's a good time for a check-in. I, I think <clears throat> what I'd like to say is a, is a little bit of a sidestep from, from Charles and Andy. Um, the main thing I really want to express to the teams is to consider two things. One is what I would call the red thread approach. Um, uh, all of you culturally, no matter where you're from, probably have the idea of the red thread. Every culture does. Um, but in product management, we talk about the red thread as as the as a core identifying property that cuts across all the ways that you communicate right it's a theme um, that your people can that people like vcs can connect to that follows through your company your product your team your your everything and helps you communicate um, you should know what your red threads are. And if you don't know, that's actually a real problem. And it comes out everywhere else in everything that Charles and Andy talked about, right? So if you don't know what your red thread is, then you're going to get in trouble in all these other places. Um, so consider that a bit. And if you don't have all your red threads mapped out, meaning all your all your themes, um, I'm going to suggest something that everyone hates doing um, and everyone thinks is worthless, but I've never, ever been in one of these sessions that didn't generate tremendous value. And that's a kind of a vision boarding session where you uncover the, the um, fundamental beliefs of your team. And again, why I'm gonna, why I wanna put this kind of different spin on what Charles and Andy said is, if you go through the standard product advice, you go through everything Charles said, everything Andy said, everything all these other product people around us are gonna say, all these pitch practices, all of this work here at the Accelerator and the work you're doing and the work you have done, and you're still 
finding areas where things just don't match up, I would bet nine times out of 10, if you do a vision boarding ses session around beliefs, the beliefs of your team, you will find why you will find those errors. You will find those inconsistencies because what you'll find is that perhaps say out of three founders, you all have fundamentally different core beliefs about why you're there, which keeps coming out in the product over and over and over again. Um, I'm so those are the two things I, I just wanted to put a capper on because as I'm listening to everybody, I'm noticing that um, in a lot of cases, you're telling multiple stories at the same time and trying to do multiple things with your product at the same time. And I think if you really explore those things, you're gonna discover that if you had your red threads and you knew what your core beliefs were, that actually all those issues would disappear. And nobody believes it until they do it. And then suddenly they go, oh, this is why, this is why people do vision porting. This is why people talk about their fundamental beliefs rather than just their products. Um, so just wanted to throw that part out. A lot of this is about communication and understanding. So uh, first start understanding why you're building these products and who you're building them for. Um, and then understanding how to communicate that. And the reason that this is important at the end of the day is that ultimately you need to find your customers. That's ultimately what you need to do. And they need to resonate with your product. Nine times out of 10, that's because you share core beliefs and you don't even know that you are sharing them. Charles mentioned Pepsi and Coke, right? Uh, they're actually two of the greatest examples of this because I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say one thing and this will bring it all into clarity. Um, Coke sells the past, Pepsi sells the future and that's how they find their customers. That's why they're so cleanly differentiated from each other, right? Coke sells the past, Pepsi sells the future. That's how they get their customers. That, that, those fundamental beliefs are what segment Coke and Pepsi drinkers globally. So um, something to think about that makes the most powerful products in the world work are beliefs. Um, all right, I'll turn it over to Q&A. Um, I uh, just wanted to put a little spin at the end of that at a problem I think many of you are having. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, again, yeah, a lot there, but you know, let's open it up to to questions if um, yeah, if we have any questions. I have the dumbest question. <laughs> um. Is uh this is all really internal, right? It's not uh something to to like that an investor or like somebody will ask you to see or like or like yes or it's just like maybe to have um the team and our thoughts very well aligned uh and to be able to strategize correctly um but so yeah well this okay. comes out in. Yeah, this comes out in everything that you're, you're, when you're pitching, this comes out everywhere. If you haven't done all this stuff, it will be apparent in your pitch within 30 seconds. Yeah, I was going to say, like, it's really a good way to maybe think about it. And so my perspective is somebody who's built products, right, and built and launched them and put them in the world and everything else. So, and I'm not saying I'm the best at it, you know, certainly Andy has maybe more time than me specifically focusing on just, you know, the product development stuff. Um, but I will say this, I find that it's a three stage thing, right? To Andy's point he made earlier, you know, the customers are doing something, right? There is, you're, you're, there isn't a problem that exists in the world where, where it's not being solved somehow. And like nobody's sitting around like, oh, I guess we don't have a solution. We're not going to do anything about it. 
Like it's that that's not a thing. They're doing something manual. They're doing something hard, whatever. That's why you're trying to do something better. If there isn't a single problem that exists that everyone's just sitting around waiting for your solution, right? That being said, if your solution rule of adoption, especially in tech, is it's got to be exponentially better for the user to feel that the transition from what they're doing to your thing was a good decision. If it's only as good as what they're doing every time, nobody likes it, right? So the three-stage process of this product, I will say, is, you know, the first stage is go through and ask yourself internally, right? You have to be honest, like, hey, is this clear to me, right? If we're, if we're going through this and I'm, I'm trying to define the product to myself, is this clear to me and my team? If you have a conversation with a team and nobody on the team understands what you're what you're trying to convey, then the answer is no, right? Because then once that's clear, then the team is clear. The second stage is, okay, if once it's clear and we have this idea of what we're trying to build and the strategy of where we want to go, then the team is aligned. You should be able to ask every member of your team how they relate to that goal and that strategy, and they get it, right? Like, yeah, we're building this. Now, is it going to be valuable? Is it going to be successful? Will people want it? That's a whole bunch of different, that's a different conversation, right? But the strategy around it, the idea around it, is that clear to you? And as Eric said, when we listen to a lot of presentations, that's a lot of stories all in one pitch, which tells us that's that's not clear, right? If you do that first one, and then everyone in your team's aligned around the second one, then the third piece is if the investors, and they do, they will come ask, right? We talked about sales, and this bleeds into sales a little bit. But if you catch their attention, they're going to ask questions, right? Because they're going to say, if I'm writing a $100,000 check, I, I, I want to ask a couple questions. I want to know about it. And if you've done the work of the first two phases, you'll be able to answer almost any question they have. Now, they may eventually give you an idea about a direction or somewhere else that they want to see it go or they can see it working. And you'll hear that all the time. You know, you pitch an investor and they come up with some like left 90 degree idea from what you're trying to do. But if you've done this, if you've done the work, you'll be able to sort of identify why that you're not going that direction and also why you're doing what you're doing, where you want to go with it in, in six months, a year, two years, five years, right? Because you've got that overall piece done. So Yeah, I just want to make a point that's a lot simpler, which is some people you talk to are product people. I love products, right? And if you tell me about uh, any software-based product, I'm probably in the 99th percentile of people who can understand what it does. And if if, if you can't tell me what the product you're working on, that's going to make me frustrated. So just basic, the basics of you need to be working on a product and, and be able to tell people what it does and why it's great. And not a bunch, not a market, right? Got to be yeah. a product. What, what, what problem are you solving? Go, cool. that answer your question, Viviana. Hi, it's me. Uh, I'm solving the problem of uh, transparency and of fairness in AI models that we are uh using today that's great cool okay manuel yeah I ju i'm just wondering uh when it comes to product strategy uh how much of the, is, the, is that more of a second pitch is face pitch because if we if we're going to talk to product strategy my feeling is that is easily 10 minutes talk right so that that you cannot condense that in the five minute pitch. So should I think of having a five minute pitch, the 10 minute pitch, the 15 minute pitch? If it takes 10 minutes, you haven't reduced it to a picture. You should be able to show someone a picture of your product. You go, here's our product. Here's some arrows showing, you know, features and benefits. You, you, you know, if it takes 10 minutes, it's not a product yet. So, but uh, we saw a couple of examples of slides, like a handful of examples. Yes, I can put it in one picture. Is that enough? Or should I Yeah, because it's a product. It goes in a box conceptually and it has features and benefits. Yeah, a, a good way to think about it would be, you know, you could make, you know, a week long course on how an iPhone works very easily, but they distill it down at one picture and have you buy the thing, right? So I, I think at the end of the day, Andy said picture, the idea. You know, if you if you can distill like if you if you can distill the idea down, right, once you get them to say yes or ask questions, then you yeah, sure. Should you have a 15 minute deck? Should you I've seen pitches and I've even done some where like I had a 45 slide deck, right, for customer. If, if I had a good investor in there, you know, because, again, for me, my personal philosophy is if I'm taking money in, 
this person's helping me there. It's a ticket to row the boat. So what are we doing is the 45. That was for me. That's why I do that. But I also do that to sort of clarify like the product idea. What's the idea? What are we doing? Right. What, what problem are we solving? That could be one, two slides max, right? That, that if, you, if it takes long, more than two slides to describe the problem you're solving, then you haven't thought about the problem long enough. That's yeah. well, another way to look at this is people are really distracted when you try to get them to use it or buy it, right? They're going to look at one screen above the fold. If you can't get to that, if you can't get, here's a picture of the thing I'm putting in a box for you. I just spent a year doing this thing just so you could get this in 30 seconds. Here's some features and here's some benefits. You're not going to sell it, right? So that's super important to me. Yeah, this is partially an exercise in in correct simplification. Um, so so it's easy to uh, it's easier to produce the week long movie about the iPhone than it is to produce the one slide about the iPhone that really captures me uh, as a customer and explains what it is succinctly and 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 easily. And again, this, this is why it's so important to understand your customer intimately, really talk to your customer a lot and get it down to just that, you know, five, 10, 15, 20%. I actually find the number of 20% of the product being used mark, uh, to be overly large. I generally find it's, you know, of early stage projects and products, it's maybe 5% that is really the killer part of that product um, and everything else is waste. Yeah, I will, I will, this is a sales, <laughs> as a sales guy, this is a sales thing. The longer your presentation, the more chances you have to lose your customer, right? You're yeah. actually increasing the chance you're gonna lose them because 10, 15, 20 slides, the chance they glaze over and check out <laughs> goes up exponentially the longer that thing gets. That's why that one slide picture Andy's talking about is so important because if all I've got is your attention, you know, especially in today's world with the iPhones and the social media, like eight, everyone's got ADD, right? We all have ADD. So, you know, it feels comfortable as a founder to have a long slide deck to get you, you to want to over explain because you're trying to give yourself more chances to recover from being wrong. Right. But the reality is, the sales reality is, the longer it is, the higher the probability you're going to lose that sale, lose that customer, lose that pitch. And think about it in the positive, the value add is you spent a year thinking about all this crap, and now you put it into a box for someone who has ADD in 30 seconds. Oh, that's a huge value add. Yeah, and, oh. and, and everybody struggles with this process, by the way, so... So like part, one of the major efforts of every startup is the process of taking a ton of really great ideas and boiling them down to just the 1% of everything you've thought about doing as experts that your customers really want and that they'll pay for it, and that you can communicate. Because if you can't communicate it, sell it, get them to use it, get them to pay for it, et cetera, then it wasn't worth building anyway because it's product no one will ever use and no one will ever see. Okay, Peter. so what I'm getting out of it is uh, focus on the five minutes. Actually, the 45 slide appendix is useless. Uh, if uh, anywhere, put it, put it in the technical documentation, but don't use it at all in your- So in your... do you guys yeah, use DocSend? If you use DocSend, it'll tell you how many seconds people spend on each slide. I've never sent out a DocSend where the average was more than like 60 seconds for the whole deck. And, you know, for really interesting <laughs> slide, 30 seconds. You know, welcome to the real world. Sorry. Right. And the appendixes are there for the analysts, not for the people who are you're pitching to that are going to make decisions about money. All the appendixes are there for it is for people to say no. There, that's just gets sifted through for people to to turn a yes into a no, because no, they're looking for things that are like, oh wait, they're violating this law. Oh wait, <laughs> they're really screwed this up. Oh wait, this is a negative sign. Oh wait, oh that's terrible. 
right? And then the analyst is going to say, no, 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 don't, don't invest in these guys, right? I, I will say this, like as a product builder myself, you know, the 45 slide deck is, is, is for you. You, you know, depending on how yes. you do stuff, right? Depending on how, you know, some people, they're whiteboarders. Some people, they get the yellow legal pad out. Some people write in newsletters, like whatever the thing is that gets your creative juices sort of working and helps you clarify. If you're a, if you're a deck builder, because that is a certain kind of person who likes to use that medium, that tool is for you. So if you, if you build a 40, there's nothing wrong with building a 45 slide deck for yourself to help you clarify what you're doing. Right. Yes. And if that's how you need to sort of do it for yourself and then to get your team involved, that they're on the same wavelength you are, that's fine. That's why I said the 45 slide thing is for you internally. If you find the right investor, partner, whatever, and you want to let them into that world, once they've already sort of signed on, that makes total sense. Right. Like, what are we doing? What are we building? You know, architectural plans are very large. Right. But like, I would say, to go out in the world and show that to strangers is, is not really probably a good place to start. That's, I think, the point we're all making. So, but don't don't take this as don't do the 45. Like, do it for yourself. Help If it helps you, absolutely. Go nuts. Yes. Yeah, and I, I, I was just going to add on the on the appendix. Um, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, for me, I, I would never send an appendix out. But, you know, I think you should bring an appendix if you're showing somebody because you never know what they're going to want to go deeper on. And it's great if you've got a slide or two in your appendix for, you know, that answers, you know, each of their questions. Um, you know, that also makes you look, you know, super prepared. And, you know, then you don't waste the time with people talking about stuff that they're not interested. They're, you're just you're optimizing the time talking about stuff that they really want to know about. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to make a, one more point that this okay. is a team effort, and maybe this is a way to use the accelerator. I once went to a guy, he specialized in building thought leaders, you know, guys that write a book, and then it becomes a cult of like, crossing the chasm or whatever. And um, what he noted is that when you talk to the people that write these books, that's all they think about. They, He said they could literally talk for two days on the topic. That's the area of expertise. That's how they excited about it they are. And that the only way it becomes boiled down to something that a normal person can understand is first you get other people that read their book and become excited about it, but their description of it is way shorter. <laughs> and then eventually it comes out to like the normal media and they boil it down into one sentence. It's not, that's not really the role of the like generator of these ideas, but it does need to go through the funnel. Right. And, and Lou, I wanted to highlight something Lou said because it's extremely important tactically. Um, never send, a, you should, internally, you should have a full reader deck because that aligns you. Internally, you should have all your appendix slides because it makes you look prepared. Internally, you should have your FAQ, which asks and answers every single question you've ever been asked by a <laughs> investor every single one those questions are incredibly valuable never let one go unrecorded every single question in a q a but never send any of those because here's why that is a list of every reason every investor will say no things they haven't even thought about things that they would never have thought about they're going to read down that FAQ and they're going to go, wait, well, wait a minute. Then? Oh, no, no, that's definitely <laughs> a no, right? So you only ask what you only answer what's asked, but internally you need every one of those things. Very important point. Never, ever send it unsolicited. And then only answer the question they ask and never any other version of that question. And then answer Good it point. in as short a form as you can. Because if you give a five <laughs> minute essay answer to a question where they just wanted to know, is it X or Y? And you gave them a five minute uh, dialogue about it because you're an expert and you know everything about this space. You know, all you did is give them 50 other things to think about that that this is a bad idea and now they have to say no. They were in love with you, but you've just given them 47 reasons to not like you, right? right. Potentially. So short, shorten it up. Okay. 
next. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Coming up to our last couple minutes, Peter, you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah. So I just wanted to add to what uh, Andy and Charles were talking about regarding, um, you know, like the example of, you know, hey, if I asked people, they would have said build a faster horse. As someone with a lot of product experience, my, my advice is never ask customers for the solution. That's not your job. Your job is to verify that they have a problem and then you come up with the solution. Um, and, and, and that's a common problem. I see people, they immediately jump to the solution and say, hey, do you like my solution? Don't, don't do that. Just focus on, hey, are these really problems? How severe is this problem? How often do you have it? Like what alternatives to use, like gather that, gather that information to shape your product, um, not their feedback on whether they like your solution or not. So I just wanted to add that advice. Well, Charles. Hi, uh, just a very quick comment. That was, I thought was absolutely brilliant. Um, Andy, Eric, Charles, really marvelous advice. Um, perhaps I could also sum it up by what Winston Churchill once said. He said, I would have written a shorter essay, but I didn't have enough time. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was Twain. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was. <laughs> perhaps as good. But a great quote. OK, um, well, uh, uh, everyone, I, I hope you got a lot of value. I know I've, I actually learned a lot. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing everybody on Wednesday. Happy Thank Crypto Moves, everyone. Great, thanks.